Okay, great. So here we are back again. We had a little mini break and um, we are now looking at S250. <clears throat> S250 is a, um, I'm gonna call it um, all but the kitchen sink law enforcement. Um, some uh, changes and suggestions and uh, around law enforcement and it, it has, very discrete parts. Some of them are related, but they are, they do tend to be discrete. So we're going to look at them in a discrete manner. And there are nine sections and we have eliminated section two because that's a section that talks about qualified immunity. And, and um, I believe um, Senator Rom Hinsdale that it was put in there to make sure that qualified immunity was dealt with in one place or the other. And it is the same bill that we've been um, having hours and hours on testimony in the Judiciary Committee. So if I could just say, you know, yeah. to me, it's part of a, a continuum of accountability for officers, because otherwise I don't think you ever get to, you know, a full the case that you need to make around qualified immunity if you don't have a registry and sort of take care of a lot of other concerns around misconduct. So I hope to see them pieces of this pass together. But yes, this I wrote this bill last year with this in, with qualified immunity in it. So yes. I wasn't anticipating it being in a separate bill. And I believe that it is exactly the same as the bill that was introduced to judiciary. I Ben wrote them both and I believe it was exactly the same bill. Am I right, Ben? Yeah, it was identical, identical as the as introduced version of S. Okay. So section two, we're not going to address. Section three, I think what we heard last time was that um, there needs to be um, more training on bias, but that it needs to be embedded in all the training, and that gets hard to start quant quantifying the hours as opposed to having a quality uh, training experience. And so um, my understanding is that the decision uh, or the testimony led us or led me to the decision that we didn't need to address that because it was being addressed and was being embedded and we didn't need to add hours. What we need to do is <clears throat> make sure we have quality training. Is that yeah, right? I mean, you know, I, I alluded to this a little bit before. I think Eitan understood. I mean, I put that section in because of a request from him, you know, previously. So um, that, that he yeah. had had more conversations and felt comfortable without more funding and more hours set aside. You know, I am okay with at this point um, because that that was something that came from him. So, you know, I, I think what still gives me pause is that some of this is done as a online module, you know, that is kind of just like click through um, and then you're done. And I think this is better done as a discussion out loud with peers. Um, so I just want to say that out loud, but I'm happy to not legislate that. And I think that um, we will um, later on after crossover, I intend to have, um, we passed 124. Uh, I keep referring to 124 and there were a lot of reports in there and some of them will be from the Criminal Justice Council and we can talk about the training and how they're doing it and the kind of training that they're doing. So we'll have, a, have reports on, on that after crossover. Section four, um, I know that Eitan sent information um, about the data that is currently collected and I believe the commissioner did also, but I'm not sure. Did everybody get that? Um, huh? Yes. Okay. So are there, is there anything in section four that is not 
currently being collected that we need to collect? I mean, I just want to say I asked all break for clarity from from the commissioner and from others. And I got a chart of, you know, overall things that are supposed to be collected, but I did not get, I mean, I just feel like the commissioner said, we are collecting this information. We have this information. So even if it takes a few days to liberate it, my impression from what he said is that we could have that information upon request even if it wasn't plainly available to people. And I did not receive it after a week of asking multiple times for it. So I don't feel satisfied that it's available or being collected and we just need to ask for it in the right way. I don't think that's fair to the public. Well, is that um, true also of what Aton sent? I, I got another document from Aton several days ago. I asked him for clarification because I said, I still don't see the information here. I scanned the whole thing and I didn't see that information. So I had asked that by today's testimony, maybe they're coming in in a few minutes, someone could produce that information, not just, it was a very long document that had a big, a big spreadsheet of what they plan to collect, no timeline, et cetera. And that, that, I did not see that information anywhere or a nod to that information anywhere. And I asked for clarification three days ago and I, I don't have it. Hmm. Okay, well, um, well, I'm sure the commissioner, I'm not sure Aton is joining us because I think what he told me is that he thought he had said what he needed to say and that they are collecting the information and that we don't need to, we don't need to address that because it is being collected, but we'll ask the commissioner when he comes in. So um, let's, I'm uh, looking around at who's here. Um, I think that w one of the um, sections that intrigued me was section nine. And I don't know, and that's, um, gaining a confession by use of false information from the arresting officer or the officers that are um, confessions based on false information. Does, is anybody prepared to talk about that and how that currently happens and why we would allow that in the first place? I mean, I know, I guess, I guess it's common, but um, Falco, did you have um, any insight into that section? Yep, so happy to speak to that, and I'm sure they'll hear from others as well. Uh, so uh -huh. for the record, um, Falco Schilling, Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. Um, and so the ACLU of Vermont is supportive of this section and think that this is evidence that can be rightfully excluded from trial. And I guess I can go into that this is a technique that can be used in interrogation practices and that can often lead to false confessions, um, which can then be used at, as evidence at trial against defendants, even if they have not committed the crime. Um, you know, interrogation techniques are one of, you know, we've seen that false confessions are a thing that happens quite regularly. Um, I, I wish I had reports from the Innocence Project with me, but there's a certain, you know, a good percentage of uh, false convictions call, come from false confessions. So just very quickly speaking to this section, we'd be very supportive of this moving forward um, and appreciate the committee looking at this and considering this as a change to current law. And is the language as it, is it the correct language? And we support the, the language as, as drafted at, at this time, but be happy to see if there's any amendments going forward. Okay, so thank you. Um, so from maybe uh, I should ask a prosecutor. Uh, do we have a prosecutor with us here? Um, oh, yes, I see. There's um, Mr. Aluzzi, state's attorney. Um, can you speak to this a little bit? Are you still with us, Vince? Um, maybe not. Um, would anybody else like to speak to this section? 
Um, Sheriff Anderson, although you, I guess, arrest, you don't get confessions, but. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. Uh, I was not prepared to speak to this uh, section. I, uh, Sheriff Harlow has been uh, a representative uh, for this mm -hmm. bill, but she wasn't able to make it today. So uh, I, I think that we might have comments. I just don't have the comments to share at this time. Okay. Um, uh, Chris, Raquel, where, do you have anything? Oh, and then I see Mike Sherling has also joined us. Thank you, Madam Chair. And no, I would not offer any comment to Section 9. I would certainly defer to Commissioner Sherling on that section. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Sherling, we're looking at Section 9. Not that we've gone through all other sections, but I jumped to this one because it seemed to me so clear that it's something we shouldn't be doing. So, and Falco has just... Uh, supported it from the ACLU point of view. And would you like to comment on it? It's the confessions based on false information, prohibiting that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I, I was on at 3.15, but there wasn't anybody here. So I checked the schedule and it says you were starting at 3.30. So apologies for the wire that was crossed. Um, Section nine, um, I, I think our, our position is this is well covered in um, existing case law. I'm not sure if you'd like more detail. We certainly have other witnesses from special investigation units, drug units, et cetera, who could give you, uh, and the legal team who could give you um, additional depth as necessary. I just want so, to say, then, so okay. I guess my question would be, is there harm in putting it in statute? I've known people who go to court quoting statute because that's what they can see. They don't always know case law. So I feel like if you're saying this is not a practice that is condoned or accepted in the court, then we might as well put it in statute. Well, uh, that's a good question, Senator. I, I think the the like everything, the devil's in the details. I, I, what I'm suggesting is that the existing case law covers um, the inappropriate use of um, investigative techniques that um, that would, there's a variety of different ways it's described. Things that would shock the conscience is the one that um, stands out to me as the one of the litmus tests set by the court. The, as written, the uh, statute would create different guardrails. So it would create um, a different landscape that would need to be litigated and it would create complexity, especially around our, uh, our undercover operations and, um, and frankly, some key cases like uh, everything from homicide to uh, uh, sexual violence and child sexual abuse cases where these um, techniques are, are most often used. It's important to note for the committee that the current training methodology is uh, not to use deception to the greatest extent possible. Um, uh, so, it, you know, we're, it's a short way of saying we're on the same page here, but I would hesitate to create um, a statutory framework that would have unintended consequences going forward because it would change boundaries that, and we wouldn't know that until after we went through a variety of litigation to figure out where those boundaries are. Can you give an example of when you think it is appropriate in egregious cases? Um, certainly, uh, well, I'll use a, a couple of examples that are specific um, to things that, in cases that I've been involved in. Uh, may or may not surprise the committee to learn that uh, in my career, part of my job has been to actually assume the role of a 13 or 14 year old boy and girl in online undercover investigations. We'd have to figure out where the intersection of that kind of work lies with what's been written here in section nine. Um, would, that would be different than getting a confession from then an interrogation that leads to a confession. 
not necessarily, Senator, a, uh, a, a confession can be made under a variety of different circumstances. And if we use that kind of deception, which is essential in an online undercover child exploitation investigations, and the person um, says something to indicate that they're, uh, they have previously uh, abused a child in response to something that was said by the undercover operative, uh, that may be inadmissible under what's been written here. So, ben, I just yes, please go ask ahead. Ben if Ben had an opinion on how the language is written around the kind of period of time in which you're talking about introducing false information. Uh, yes, I can. I realize I never introduced myself for the record. I'm Ben Obrogowski from the Office of Legislative Counsel. And, you know, I can read into the record um, the most recent case law about what an involuntary confession is. Um, and, and then as comparison, what the, the statute or bill language is written. So an involuntary confession is admissible under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, it doesn't prohibit all police tactics or psychological pressure. Rather, a defendant's statement is admissible as voluntary if it was a product of the defendant's own balancing of competing considerations. Would you repeat that last part? If it was a product of the defendant's own balancing of competing considerations, and I'll get into a little bit more detail as to what that is. Um, and the test is whether, based on the totality of circumstances, the suspect's will was overborne by police. A confession is involuntary if law enforcement coercion played a significant role in inducing it. Now, the effects of police coercion and the characteristics of the defendant are both considered in a voluntariness analysis. Not all psychological coercion exerted by police is prohibited, especially where a promise is ambiguous or nonspecific. Um, for example, a police officer use, use of psychological coercion involving promises of leniency and misrepresentations of authority can render a confession involuntary. But lies about incriminating evidence uh, taken alone are not enough to make any resulting confession involuntary. Uh, the, and the court basically reviews the facts established at, um, regarding the voluntariness for plain error. That's if it goes to an appellate review. So it's really, it's a case by case basis. Um, and psychological coercion of leniency and misrepresentations of authority can make something involuntary, uh, can make a confession involuntary, but lies about incriminating evidence by themselves don't necessarily render a confession involuntary on their own. So what this section would do is really outline definitively what constitutes an involuntary confession rather than sort of leaving it up to the courts to decide. Um, but this is sort of what the, the court's test is that I just read. Um, and then this, the proposed section 6609 would more definitively state exactly what the involuntariness is, and what constitutes an involuntary confession. And Ben, you may not know the answer to this, but New York, introduced and I believe passed something similar. I'm looking right now to see if it passed. Um, do you happen to know if this aligns with New York's? What did, did you learn if this aligns? Uh, that, that's something that I have to look a bit more into uh, to see the comparison between the two. So sure. this is saying that, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if you were looking for more from me, um, Madam Chair. Yeah, if you. Um... Uh, uh, only uh, uh, Ben's uh, description was uh, exactly what I would have our legal folks uh, explain to you as well. And um, uh, in our assessment is the courts have handled this well. Um, this is something that in Vermont is, uh, is fairly well established law and the guardrails are, um, are in the right place and well well known, well trained on uh, section nine would be more disruptive than helpful. So I guess 
Um, the what we're what you're saying is that the courts and that we have case law in Vermont that defines when what what kinds of information can be used or what kinds of pressure or whatever can be used to obtain a confession and that the courts um, follow that that common law standard and that they apply it when they're looking at a confession and that if we did if we wrote this we are we are changing the um, changing that common law understanding by the courts and by law enforcement as to what they can and can't do. Is that what you're saying? It is. It is. I, I would describe it slightly differently. The, the standard in play here is a constitutional standard, both uh, under two articles of the United States Constitution and the Vermont Constitution. And the um, so this is a constitutional standard against self-incrimination. Statements made must be knowing, intelligent, and voluntary. And the courts have uh, created very well-established um, guardrails and rules around um, what constitutes a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary uh, uh, statement uh, in a custodial environment. And then also what um, constitutes an appropriate, what constitutes custody, uh, to create that custodial environment and then what other parameters um, like undercover operations where uh, where those guardrails are so there's an enormous amount of um, uh, detail uh, that we train on uh, to ensure that uh, folks are staying within the boundaries of the constitutional standards and the case law that flow from those constitutional standards Does anybody else have a comment or a question on this? Well, I don't know if Falco wants to weigh in, but I mean, other states are doing this as well. What I'm hearing from the commissioner is it relies on individual judges to follow that case law and that sort of trust us we're working seems to be the continued refrain on a lot of these sections when, you know, Commissioner Sherling, you weren't here when I said that I was frustrated that I asked for information you said was available around uh, the ability to, um, to collect data and liberate data for the general public around use of force and injury and death related to use of force. And I asked, I'll, I'll break for that. You had said last time that that is something that's being collected and can be made available. And then I feel like the attitude changed when I asked for that information. So. You know, I feel like we keep hearing, this is what we're doing, this is already in practice, and then not seeing the evidence of that. So Senator, taking back to front the most recent comments, you're not accurately representing my communication with you relative to that. To begin with, I apologize for any uh, confusion over what I was describing. I was describing that we now have an information technology system in place that is designed to collect all of that information. Uh, and to be able to report it out in the future in both dashboard form and in raw data form. Additionally, I sent you examples of those dashboards uh, that are currently publicly available on the state police website that dig into the details of uh, use of force and the intersection of everything from race to the types of encounters to the time of day that those uh, events occurred. And uh, there was extensive communication answering your questions. So to indicate that we were not responsive or somehow Misleading is certainly not accurate. There may have been a lack of clarity on the fly uh, in so, terms of what I was trying to relay to take the- I'm sorry, but the information itself wasn't presented. You said you showed a, a long list of things that will be collected in the future. Is that accurate? If you no, I did not send you a list of things that would be collected in the future. In the legislation, there are a variety of things that are contemplated to be direct, uh, sort of directives to collect. What I'm indicating is that all of those fields of data are now are currently able to be collected in a new system that has been in place now for roughly 60 days. And I have been testifying for two years 
that part of our modernization strategy is to make not only the intersection uh, with the fields of data that um, are contemplated in the legislation, but basically every connection that could be made between events, um, people without biographical specificity, um, use of force, mental health, opiates, a, a host of, of different um, really high profile and important data points. Uh, the goal is to make those available using the types of dashboards that I sent you links to, and also to make all of that information publicly available um, in aggregate form so that researchers, Vermonters, students, others can do their own um, uh, individual queries of that data. Um, what I've described previously is it gives people the opportunity to query that data and ask questions that we haven't yet even thought to ask. And when is that? That is work that is all in progress now. As I indicated a couple of times, the dashboards I sent you links to are examples of what we, are, we will be working to build. Again, we're 60 days into this new system and Frankly, we are quite distracted by the volume of, uh, of legislation that we have to work on right now. So working on other things uh, at the same time we're working on a pandemic is a little difficult. So you don't have a timeline? We're working as quickly as possible. So, but so there, oh yes, yeah. so, Allison. Yeah, so I mean, and in Aton's report too, Aton sent us that, work and it all says data will be collected. And I, I can I understand, you know, Acacia's concern, which is that definitely you've identified great data to collect. But, but Michael, are you saying to us that, that for six, that now you've got that up and going, you have been collecting it for 60 days, how long before we might get a sense of, of being able to see the results of some of that data collected, how long do we need to collect some of that data in order to report on it for any substantive, you know, uh, uh, ability to analyze or, analyze or look at any uh, impactful data collection? Uh, it's a great question, Senator. To uh, to have really impactful analysis, you're going to need multiple years of data to compare and contrast and look at trending. So we're at the precipice of. Uh, or at the beginning of that process. So it'll take quite a while before we actually have data sets that are large enough to um, have meaningful uh, information in them. Um, what I'm trying to get across is that we are, we are actively working on innovative ways to collect. And then in, in, as I've indicated, we're now working on you know, how are we going to um, do the, the forward-facing analysis and create these dashboards so that we're not a year behind in rendering information that it can be done in 30 or 60 or 90 days uh, more on the fly than, uh, than has been uh, okay. possible using our more antiquated systems that we've now moved away from. Right, and I, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate it's taken time to get it up. And I, I, I appreciate that the challenge, it, you know, we've discussed that in the different ways, different police departments report information. I remember in the past, we've discussed that data is collected and, and uh, transmitted diff what different now, I think all on the, in the same fashion or on the same system. Um, I, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to get a sense of when, you know, and it's hard to think that, oh my gosh, we have to wait years to get data, uh, you know, any kind of analysis on some of this data. but. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that may be the frustration of, of, of Keisha, some of Keisha's frustration here is that I applaud the, the, the moving forward in all of your modernization efforts and moving forward on, on this data collection. It's just, it's just hard to know that it's going to be a while before we get to see the results. I'm going to Thank call you, on Senator. Mark in a minute here, but I, I, I would like to say that, that it isn't there's always more data to be collected and more ways of um, looking at the data. But I also know that five years ago when we did our tour of the state, there we could look on the state police um, website and we could see every single um, call and the nature of the call that was um, in every town. Every town has access to that and we could look at that also. So 
the data is always evolving. It isn't as if there's never been data collected and data um, given out. And I don't know why um, I did it, but about two years ago, I did a search um, for all uses of force by state police and um, the race of the victim. And I was able to, to do that. And I'm, I'm a real novice here at, at looking at information and oh, gathering it. So, and I, I was able to do that. And that was at least two years ago. So, um, Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I forget if I've introduced myself. Or, so for the record, uh, Sheriff Mark Anderson of Wyndham County. I'm the president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. I did come prepared to talk about data today. Um, oh, good. Informally, I serve as uh, one of the, the key focal points for uh, communicating the traffic stop race data information uh, up until uh, the end of 2020 for roughly 40 of Vermont law enforcement agencies. Uh, this is the data that uh, Dr. Seguino and her uh, research colleagues use uh, that uh, the Crime Research Group and uh, Dr. Joy have used, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uses. So to that end, uh, and specific to the, the language uh, sought after in this bill, much of that is already captured for all traffic stops. And that has been captured since I believe it was 2000, uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but roughly 2015, 2016. Um, one of the difficulties when we talk about data, uh, and this has been the subject of testimony in other committees, uh, I spoke with Senator Sears about this uh, specifically uh, also as part of, I believe it was justice reinvestment. Um, and there's a variety of other places where uh, it has intersected. But when we start talking about data, uh, one of the difficulties that we currently face and, or face up until the end of uh, 2021 uh, was that everybody has different uh data dictionaries, if you will. And so uh, an example of this is uh, when we talk about uh, gender, there are some uh, entities within the state of Vermont that consider gender to be male and female. There are some entities that consider gender to be uh, about cisgender, uh, non-binary, uh, and other expansions of that. Uh, when we talk about law enforcement information systems, we interact with uh, the FBI and the national um, national incident-based reporting system. So uh, having access to uh, town level crime information uh, is based off of the NIBRS reporting system, which all Vermont law enforcement agencies uh, submit data to. Uh, they do not recognize anything other than male and female, uh, and they are specific to sex. So there are, um, that's just dealing with, with uh, sex and gender alone. When we talk about race, uh, the Vermont Judicial Bureau uh, acknowledges Hispanic as a race, which it is an ethnicity, which is an entirely separate field to capture. So when we try to communicate across multiple different uh, data systems that are collecting all of this, uh, it is incredibly difficult to provide any reasonable analysis uh, that is an apples to apples comparison. Uh, Commissioner Sherling has testified to uh, this new data system uh, that now truly allows uh, all Vermont law enforcement to communicate in state with in state data dictionaries uh, that allow us to, or allow researchers uh, to be able to analyze and develop uh, information that is valuable either for their studies uh, or for the General Assembly's uh, uh, digestion. Uh, Senator Clarkson, you said you, you wanna have the information now and uh, to some degree that's available now, it's just what conclusions can we draw from it? Uh, and so uh, with the, uh, as Commissioner Sherling has testified uh, about making dashboards available, there are things that the Department of Public Safety has, uh, has far more resources than many of the smaller Vermont law enforcement agencies. Um, me being a, a computer aficionado, uh, and I love playing with data and Excel and, and other tools, uh, I'm unique. The reason why I took on this role to help communicate out the traffic stop and race data is because I talked to several sheriffs and chiefs who said, I don't even know how to run that report. Uh, we're walking through how to turn on computers. And so there's, there's a generational uh, turnover that, that is also occurring that allows access to these things. And what, uh, what this initiative with the new 
uh, data system has allowed is for people who do have the skill sets uh, to do it. It provides a resource uh, for uh, agencies and organizations that uh, traditionally haven't had the ability to do these things to do it uh, because it was provided through uh, a, a lot of forward thinking methodologies to get us all on the same system without having to, to consider things such as cost to small agencies where um, the software system means either having another officer or having the software. Uh, so uh, I, I'm happy to speak more in depth about uh, about it. I know I can also make a lot of people yawn when we start to talk about data collection, uh, but it is a very complex thing for which uh, I hold an acorn in a giant forest of research, uh, uh, data science, uh, database design, uh, application development. Uh, and I have a whole presentation I'd be happy to, to share uh, if I were not on my phone. So we kind of leapt from section nine back over to four, but, but I'm curious if we have satisfied our, that do we need to have section four in this bill? since we're now talking about data and we have Mark with us, is section four, which is the data collection, if it's already happening and it's a matter of um, figuring out how to, how to get it in the most presentable and usable forms, do we need to have this section of the bill, which tells us what to collect, but not how to, um, but doesn't give any um, help in um, formatting it or um, making it available and usable? That's the question. Mark. I, I would like to submit for your consideration uh, a caution or hesitation uh, to legislate what data to collect, but rather capture the intent of what you're looking for us to collect. Um, my presentation that I cannot share with you right now, uh, but I'm happy to share, uh, is based off of the, the traffic stop race data report that was passed, I believe in the 14 session. Uh, and we started capturing data in 2015. It was left to interpretation, uh, what data is collected at what frequency, how do we analyze it? And so we had some agencies uh, with, with a more, uh, conservative interpretation uh, who were tracking race data on parking tickets. And when I saw that data, I said, how do you know the race of the person if it's a parking ticket and there's no person yeah. present? Um, so the, they're generally we develop these, um, the data points to capture so that we can get the relevant information out by talking with researchers. And uh, what was illuminating for me is that talking with Dr. Uh, Seguino, talking with Dr. Joy uh, and a variety of other stakeholders on the traffic stop and race data report alone, what we found was that there were numerous assumptions made that would then lead to various different conclusions that wasn't based on the data because different people had different understandings of how it was collected. Um, so as part of a bill that Aton was a part of, I can't quote it, it's part of this current legislative session about racial justice statistics. It might be Senate Judiciary, but I'm certainly happy to be corrected by anyone who knows. Uh, one of the, the goals was to uh, capture within, um, within state government uh, an office that was able to help develop what these data points should be and allow it to be uh, flexible enough to pivot away from uh, from uh, old research concepts to new research concepts so that when we find out that uh, it's been demonstrated through research and science that technique A is no longer valid, we can then say, let's pivot to technique B. Currently, uh, we have had to evolve our data systems to match legislative uh, expectations, which also uh, probably don't result in the information that is desired to be communicated out. An example of this, I believe it was last year, the session before, uh, we are now capturing whether a uh, use of force data is used on traffic stops. Now I can wholly respect why it's desired to know if use of the force data is uh, uh, use of force information uh, about law enforcement interactions with people. But historically within my own agency's perspective, use of force doesn't occur on traffic stops. 
What's more valuable is to know where it does occur. And that is usually outside of traffic stops in my agency's case. Uh, so we have a use of force report that we're able to report out on that is completely, um, would completely ignore uh, uh, traffic stop uh, information. Uh, and so allowing us to be able to look at it based on current research practices, I think would be the best thing and trying to support, uh, I don't want to necessarily submit that it is uh, the uh, executive director on racial equities office's responsibility, but um, at least as a starting point of a conversation to say someone such as Susanna Davis uh, and her office be given the resources to help say what data needs to be tracked, how do we report these things out, and just simply capture in statute, if it's necessary, the intent of what we're trying to get out of the system, not the directive of how to get it, um, because it, is, it, it often becomes far more complex uh, when we talk about the various nuances of a traffic stop or a car crash or a use of force incident. Thank you, Mark. That, that was helpful. Okay. So, oh, yeah. is, Keisha, unless you, you were going to say something, I was going to ask Falco to talk about Section 4 and whether he believed it should remain. But, but I thought you were trying to say something first. Yeah, no, Falco can. So happy to happy to jump in. Um, so as I testified before, we're supportive of including Section Four in this legislation moving forward because we do think there is a value to enumerating the information that needs to be collected in statute. Um, one that we aren't. And this is a conversation we're having on the the bill that was referenced earlier, where there we're saying, all right, well, we have a certain category of information we'd like to collect but we're gonna wait for rulemaking down the road or a group to get together and then discuss what information we might want. I think it's clear this is information which is valuable and that's the reason it was enumerated in this bill. And we've already heard that this data is going to be collected. So I see no harm in saying if this data is already going to be collected and we think it's important moving forward and requiring in statute to be collected. Um, so I think that's just kind of where we come down on this, this uh, portion of the bill and that we are supportive of including data reporting requirements specifically in statute. Yeah, I, I was, that's sort of what I was going to say. I didn't hear a reason not to. And, um, you know, I, I often, I, I need to read the, you know, bill on the Office of Racial Statistics, which I also hope passes. I hope a lot of these things, you know, that Susanna has been working on become available. I think Susanna's clearly also been tasked with things beyond racial justice. And it's hard for me to know where, for in so many ways, you have to combine racial data with other demographic data. You have to know if this is happening to people of color with disabilities. You know, you, you have to know if this is happening to black men. Um, there is a real need to understand a lot of intersectional information um, and that, that, especially on this front, uh, you know, when you look at suspension and expulsion or other punitive measures, you see a pattern with kids with disabilities and kids of color. And so I just don't want to lose track of other critical information. And I think uh, use of force is a particularly important item to uplift um, as we look for more information from the Criminal Justice Council about how they're investigating use of force and what's happening when complaints are made about use of force that results in injury and death. So I'm going to throw out a, I, um, if this information is already being collected and um, why would we put it into statute? I think that Mark suggestion that um, sometimes listing things in a statute is not defining enough and could be too or could be too defining one way or the other. So if we are saying we, when when this happens, we are going to get the age, gender and race of the driver. That's all we're that's the only information we're asking for on the driver or the victim. And it's um, it doesn't ask for disability. It doesn't ask for um, any anything else that would um, give you information on the driver or the victim. It's just ace 
age, gender, and race. So by putting that in there, what we're saying is that that's all you need to collect. That's what you should be collecting is just that. And then there's the question of who defines what gender means and who defines what race means. As Mark pointed out, um, in some places, um, Hispanic is a race and in some it's an ethnicity. So how do you, so I, 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 so, I mean, so the intent here, and maybe that's helpful, is that we get this information isn't buried somewhere or researchers don't have to go looking for it, that we hear regularly, maybe once annually, what's happening with use of force, who is experiencing use of force that results in injury or death, and how that compares to who, what's being investigated by the Criminal Justice Council. I also think that there's a role for the legislature to play in deciding what kind of data should be collected. And, you know, we know bureaucracies can sometimes move slowly. Legislatures, our, our job is to sometimes think further ahead. And I think it'd be good for us to get in the habit of talking about what kind of data should be collected because we might, because we're close to constituents, we might know before the bureaucracy does that something is emerging and is important. So I think that it would be important for us to, get to play more of a role in talking about what data should be collected and what it should be used for. And what data would you put in there that should be collected? Well, I think that with the data should be the basic stuff like you mentioned before that, but it should be that should be the minimum, you know, should include the following and then go through the data that should be included. Um, and are you suggesting we put that in this bill? I'm suggesting that it's in section four. But they're already collecting this data. Right, but there's no reason for us not to put our mark on it and say that we think this is important. In other words, because they're already doing something, I don't think that means that we should just think that we don't have a role to play in it. No, no, that isn't my point. My point was, if we put this in, in the legislation, and we say these are the things that we need to collect, then the bureaucracy could say this is what you told us to collect. We're that's what we're going to collect. That's all we're going to collect. We don't have to collect more because you've made it clear to us that these are the thing, the three things that are important: age, gender, and race. That's what we're going to collect. So by listing them we might be limiting the kinds of things that are actually collected because people like Susanna and Commissioner Sherling and Sheriff Anderson and Falco can sit down and say, oh, and Stephanie, I can't think of what her last name is, can sit down and say, well, wait a minute, if you, if you really wanna get at this, what you should also be collecting is one of the things that Keisha said, the disability status is our, our or, um, and, and what do we mean by gender? Are we going to limit it to what the FBI limits it to or the national to male and female? Are we going how are we going to define those things? And by putting it in the statute, I think we're, we're limiting. We're telling them this is all you have to do. I like Keisha's suggestion that we should, and, and we could ask for that. We don't have to put it in a report, require a report, but we could say once a year or once every six months, we're gonna say, how is this data collection working? Give us a, bring it, bring it in and show it to us. Show us how to, how to manipulate it so that we can then help our constituents know how to manipulate it. Show us, show us what you're collecting and how it's being applied to the, um, policies and how it's being applied to the um, the um, prosecution rate. I, that isn't the right word. Sure. But right. And, and how it's accessible. Right. So, this so conversation, you, you, I agree with what you're saying about every six months or whatever, it's, you know, you review and decide what should go in. Do we put that into the legislation or do we just presume that that's going to happen or do, how do we make sure that that happens? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. That's our responsibility to ask for it, I think. 
I'm, I've been asking for it. I mean, you know, but you, I, I but you I, did get some of it and you got what was available. So, I mean, we've seen some pretty alarming statistics from Aton's report, right? That, you know, the rate of youth criminalization for mm -hmm. black young people is off the charts in places where there are large numbers of young of black youth. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I liken it to like the DV commission that right, has a report once a year that tells us these are the statistics around domestic violence that's resulted in death. Mm -hmm. um, and we look at that every year as a way to, to have a touchstone for how we improve our domestic violence related laws. I, I think, you know, use of force is an important touchstone. I think, you know, youth incarceration <laughs> is, is an important touchstone. I think there are some key touchstones that should be linked to a report around what they're doing to drive those, to change those numbers. So we could, we, we could require a report similar to the DV report every year. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, a, um, a report around use of force. And um, we do get an incarceration report, I believe. Um, um, well, the Corrections Oversight you, Committee gets all that. Well, the Department of Corrections puts out a report, a really extensive report every year on who's incarcerated, how long, for how long, the race, the gender, the age. It's, they put out a very extensive report every year, but I don't think we've ever asked for a use of force report. So I think that that is something we, 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 we should consider doing. Falco? Um, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, to share our perspective on this in that when we look at this data, we don't see this as limiting the collection of any other data in any way. Um, this is would be what's the floor. This is what's required. And if there needs to be more flexibility and other data or information to be collected, that's still something that the entities that were collecting the data could collect more data and report on it, especially if it's helpful in clarifying what the situation looks like. And <clears throat> I think maybe it's a something that can be illustrative of why it's helpful to have data requirements and statutes. You were just speaking to the Department of Corrections and their reporting on the demographics of the people who are incarcerated in the state of Vermont. For a couple of years, they completely stopped issuing that report that you were talking about. It wasn't until the start of the pandemic when we had some pretty concerted advocacy with the Department of Corrections and a group of stakeholders that they started issuing more regular reports on what the demographics of the population looks like. And even the numbers, like the daily headcount was something that was hard to get for quite a while unless you were actually working within the facilities. And so we were very pleased with that. And that was something that did not require statute. But as things move forward, there were times when that collection was no longer, you know, that data was no longer being made public. There was gaps in the reporting. And that does mean that things can change over time. And I think that is where the value in creating a baseline for information to be collected um, in statute lies. So that's just my perspective on that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there seems to be a recurring theme that somehow I am opposed or the department is opposed or both of us are opposed uh, to making progress. And it strikes me based on the conversation that's happening in committee right now that that first, that is not the case. Uh, I've never been accused of going slowly or inhibiting progress. And um, I am probably as frustrated as any person uh, in Vermont with the pace of uh, change in state government on a number of different fronts. But with that as the background, I'll make some observations that I hope will help us collectively get to uh, improvements in systems. Uh, the first is th the opposition is, is in part because um, like in section four, it, the effort is too small. It's not enough. It, it doesn't, it's, and it's duplicating what we already do. We should be making all of our data available. And that's what we're working toward. 
um, it, with, with the exception of personally identifying information and you know uh, uh, confidential reports, but I'm, I'm talking about the data fields so that you can do relational analysis. There are other sections of a variety of legislation that are solving problems that are not problems in Vermont. And we are opposed to those things because they distract from focusing on the things that we do need to focus on. And I will observe that very few of the sponsor legislators for key pieces of uh, public safety legislation have engaged the Department of Public Safety prior to introducing the legislation. If they had, we could have helped to create a better bill or even ask the question or, or even made the statement, listen, the question you're asking is something that's already answered or, or solving a problem that uh, already has a particular solution in Vermont. But over here, there's another thing that does need to be worked on. So I just thought it important to give you the context of why we are not opposed to change. Um, quite the contrary, we're running headlong into the future and have been for decades. But we need to focus on the things that are going to be impactful and not be distracted by the things that simply create confusion in the operating environment and don't take us forward. Anybody else? I, I will say, for me, I'm not convinced that we need to put this in legislation if it's already being done. I'm, I, I do think that it would be that asking for a report, um, an annual report, um, similar to the DV report, um, I think is a good idea. But I, I don't see any need to put into legislation what we're already already doing. I don't know where everybody anybody else is. I can agree with that. I mean, I was looking at the the link that Commissioner Sherling just sent and wondering how you did, it to, did he send it to all of us? I don't know. Yes. Oh, yes. get that. I did. Yes. Oh, right. Well. Look it up. Well, yes. Um, so if we're. So um, I think your, the answer sounds like no, we don't need it. Well, I mean, to me, I think these things need to put it, be put in context in a way that's public at least once a year. I mean, we just heard that there isn't there isn't consolidated information. There now is for the last two months. And so then we're seeing data going back to use of force year after year. So it sounds like that's that's uh, incomplete data, or you now have a better system to track it. Um, you know, it it th this doesn't help the average person, I think, or give us the opportunity once a year to ask questions about what is happening. How do you have 170 inc incidents and 176 subjects of force? You know where help the public digest what changes are being made to accomplish greater outcomes. So I, I think we should have a report. I don't think it just needs to be use of force. I think there are some key indicators and I would love the, the department's input on, you know, which indicators you're trying to change year over year and how to make a report that the public can truly, you know, understand and, and be part of that's honest and transparent. That's what people have been asking for for a, a decade or more. Those are all great observations, Senator. The, the dashboard I just sent you has been publicly available and we release it with, uh, with press releases for the last three years. So it goes back and you can see the trending for three years. It is specific to the state police, although I observed that we released similar reports when I was chief in Burlington for um, the seven and a half years I was chief and, and actually dating back before that when Chief Tremblay was there. Um, so these efforts at transparency, particularly around use of force and race data collection have been in play for some time. Um, the, the goal now is to be able to aggregate that data and represent this on a statewide basis. And it, it is work that's gonna take uh, a little while to, to do as uh, Sheriff Anderson indicated, it's, it's not without its complexities and uh, ensuring that we're rendering data in an accurate way, but it, it is 
we've taken the first big steps. It's uh, it was a key project um, when I arrived at Public Safety, and it has now come to fruition. And now we take it to the next level when we start to uh, do our data analysis using the new system. So, yeah. Sheriff Anderson, you're saying that as of two months ago, or based on the ongoing work of collecting better data, all local law enforcement are now collecting this information and, and you are helping to aggregate it as well, because that's been a major concern is not just the state police that have been probably more transparent on this scale, but local law enforcement and local incidents of use of force. Uh, so specific that the, what I'm referencing is the traffic stop race data report that's required under 20 VSA 2366, I believe. Uh, and that's where it's actually already captured uh, many, many, if not all of these fields in statute uh, in the either the last biennium or the last year, uh, the capturing of use of force data was added to that. Uh, so to answer that question, yes, we've been capturing that at the local uh, and uh, county levels, uh, as should all state agencies. The uh, I believe that's been a requirement since two, uh, September 2015. Uh, so that's been captured and failure to do so actually uh, comes with the consequence uh, of loss of uh, funding or loss of access to state services, which includes the services of the police academy. Uh, so there's already uh, incentive, there's already a stick. Um, one of the things I frequently advocate for is the carrot, uh, which uh, Commissioner Sherling's uh, ability to provide the, uh, this records management system uh, free of charge to local and county agencies has actually been a carrot. Uh, we have been talking about how to improve the, the traffic stop race data report. Uh, so we've referenced the floor. Uh, we've been working with researchers to build out uh, a far better one because we know based on their research and uh, peer, uh, peer reviewed model, uh, peer reviewed studies that we can actually provide information that helps us either identify issues, solve problems, or communicate why it's not a problem. So that work has already been underway. I've worked with CRG, uh, Dr. Seguino, uh, and uh, I believe it's, I forget the name of the new vendor for the council, but there's a new vendor we just met for uh, back in, I believe two months ago, uh, to talk about their research. And some of these issues are being identified of how we uh, co-locate uh, the information that we're all capturing the difficulty in use of force reporting right now, while uh, our new tool does capture uh, and provide agencies the ability to capture uh, use of force information, a lot of agencies have already gone to other vendors prior to this acquisition and uh, they're using their own tools. So now it's going back to, uh, we could have upwards of 20 different data dictionaries uh, where we have a tool that allows for the capture use of force data and every agency uh, should, can, and most likely does capture use of force information, it might not be in a way we can uh, uh, connect apples to apples. So these are uh, where we will make requests to the legislature, please provide us the resources to do this work. Please provide the academy the, the, uh, the funds to fund a, an investigator to look into excessive use of force or an attorney. And these are things that the legislature's done. Um, I believe it was this committee that actually uh, put the stick in uh, uh, about uh, about the funds as well as the access to state services uh, based on uh, the public safety agencies, the small P uh, uh, for public safety, not the Department of Public Safety, uh, but public safety agencies saying we want to be measured and we want to have transparency. We want to have an open door to this conversation. We want to be partners in the conversation. Uh, so the, um, I, Senator, I, I drifted a little, I think. I hope I've answered your question. I'm happy to clarify if I have not. I, I think I need clarification. I mean, so is what you're saying that there is still a discrepancy in the information that's being collected and we're not going to be able to see it aggregated or it took time to aggregate it and now that will be available soon is local law enforcement incidents of use of force reported in a streamlined way. Number two, uh, the, the system that Commissioner Sherling referenced that's been in existence for 60 days, uh, that is where we are, we've begun the, the marathon of apples to apples comparison, but agencies across the two systems that existed before 60 days ago uh, they were capturing uh, much of this data. 
And then what we're also talking about is the future, which is we want to do more. Um, so data dashboards that are accessible, uh, working with data scientists uh, and um, and engineers to come up with structures that make sense. I mean, we're talking about building the basement of this data system right now so that we have a house that that can stand on and Vermonters can walk into and look into uh, if you'll allow for the metaphor. And Senator, also responsive to your question, I, I mentioned this during my brief testimony that was a little confusing a uh, week before last. There are two agencies who have opted out of the statewide system. Uh, so they've opted not to use the, the statewide system that we're providing to agencies for free. Uh, I don't think there's a nefarious um, purpose in that, but there are two that are not on. Um, next up, so, th so there's complete clarity. They have clarity. Large populations that will not be captured in critical data because of that. Uh, relatively small um, departments, but in terms of service area, I don't know the populations offhand. Um, what I was going to add to Sheriff's uh, Anderson's sort of carrot and stick uh, analogy is that we got 71 out of 73 agencies on board using the carrot. Um, next up is um, trying to ensure that folks are now put it, there's, a, there's the ability for this system to um, aggregate not only the traffic stop information, but use supports information. So um, we have begun the process of outreach to agencies to, uh, to try to incentivize them to use that particular use of force module instead of having another system that we would then have to make connections to and um, do data analysis across multiple systems. That's what we're trying to get away from. Um, if that uh, effort doesn't come to fruition and the, the carrots don't work, we could be back next year saying, listen, we don't have, uh, we haven't been successful in getting everyone to use this uh, universally for all the data fields that we'd like to uh, analyze on the fly. It may make sense for you to look at um, uh, creating more of a structure to that. Um, but we're so early in the process, it's premature to say that that's necessary. So anybody else have any thoughts on this? So, well, I guess I'd sort of like to get a sense of where we are at the moment. I mean, this is, Michael, I have to say, this is great what, what you sent us. Thank you very much. And it, uh, I, I appreciate seeing it. It's very interesting and confirms lots of things we might have already thought about things like time of day and days of week uh, that things happen that aren't great. <laughs> um, I, I'm just curious where we are with section four now. Are we asking, are we replacing this specific data request with a report on uh, the on the intended data we are wanting to collect that we're and an update on an annual basis or an, basically an update on an annual basis of where the collection is, how it's being analyzed and how it's being and a presentation of how it's presented and accessible to the public. Is that what we're replacing section four with? I thought that's where we were headed, but just curious. I think that's up to the committee. That would be my intention, but I think that that's uh, okay. up to the committee. I'm on board with that because it, it does, I think that sounds good because then we'll be able to see fairly soon and uh, at least where they uh, are and in, I don't know, whenever, January, February 1st, whatever is, would be great. I mean, I'd love to have more time to just go through all the things they're collecting in this, in this, in, in, in uh, this is just use of force data dashboard. You have other traffic stop dashboards. You have other dashboards that you've got, like, that are as, as prepared as this, right, Michael? You've got You've got a couple others that are are have data that's analyzed like this, or at least presented. So we so do, let's oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, not necessarily in dashboard form. We we lost some momentum there because of COVID, and the the data teams that work on this were have been working on the COVID dashboards now for two years. Um, a a, a, uh, a thought that might work uh, equally well, um, and I heard this suggested in another committee. Uh, potentially sending a, having the committee in lieu of legislation, send us a 
letter of interest or almost a letter of intent indicating an interest in statewide dashboards similar to the use of force dashboard and integrating traffic stop data would give us a, an, a, an interesting additional piece of the foundation with which to have conversations with agencies statewide about um, uh, helping that process along and telegraphing that in the absence of uh, doing it the right way now, uh, there may be legislation mandating that it done, is done the right way in the future. Um, it gives the requisite plus flexibility um, and telegraphs the legislature's intent. Um, again, I'm pirating that from another uh, uh, committee that uh, it, something similar was suggested. So I, I, I would not be opposed to putting um, a report requirement in here that asks for an annual report on not not necessarily use of force, but on on how what data is being collected, how available is it to um, for people to access, and um, how is it being used in terms of policies and um, um, procedures. And possibly another thing to add to that would be whether there's a need for new new data points or not. Yeah, well, well questions you would, data yeah. that's collected. Yeah. That's what I said. What data is being collected? And yeah. at the current time, and then there would be opportunity, I would suppose, for um, a legislative committee to say, you know, maybe you ought to think about collecting this data in addition. Right, right. or recommendations from the agency. Right, whatever, about, but uh, uh, just a report that says what data is being collected, how accessible is it? Yeah. And and um, yeah. how is it being used? Yeah. How, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, so Chair White, if I may ask a question just about the, the details of what you're looking for, where would, so just to make sure I have it straight, um, so this would be an annual report, um, at what point in the, in the year would, would uh, the committee want it? Um, and right now under uh, section 2366, which I believe was referenced in previous testimony, there is the report that we discussed about race, uh, roadside stop data. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I believe, produced every September 1st. Um, do we want it to coincide with that? And where do we want the report to go to? That I believe that that report is um, receiving the agency of the report um, shall also report it annually to the General Assembly. Uh, do we want it to go to the General Assembly? Do we want to go to specific committees? I, I think uh, we want it to go to uh, specifically government operations and judiciary committees. Yes. And, and I think that I would make it January 15th. I don't know why on earth we ever would make reports um, due on September 15th or November 15th when, yes. when well, we're because not in our, session and because of our drafting. I think because of our drafting deadline. Well, I, I misspoke a little bit on that. That's when uh, the law enforcement agencies provide the data to the executive director of the racial equity uh, of oh. racial equity um and then it, there actually is no um firm date about when it's reported to the general assembly i would i would make it january i i yeah and I, if i could say yeah. i also think we're looking for qualitative reporting right yeah. you know we're, like they get the data and then we want to understand it in context and how they're, you, you know, what policy changes they might need or investments they might need. You know, I'm hearing, oh, mm -hmm. come talk to us. Well, you know, mm -hmm. look, tell, show us the data and tell us what you need to improve outcomes. Right. Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to say by how it's being used. But yes, I think that is exactly what we want. Okay. So, and then just getting into the substance of what would be in the report. Um, it would be a request of what data collected and, and how expansive would it be? Would it just be for, you know, use of force incidents? Would it be no. for suicide stop? Just, just all data that's collected by law enforcement? Law enforcement. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 yeah. 
and then my agencies yeah. are reporting. I mean, it, right. And I really want to emphasize. I mean, it sounds like this has not been done across all local public safety and law enforcement agencies thus far. That that is what's new and would be available. So just making sure that is explicit that we're looking for all law enforcement data, not just state police. Well, and, and to, it sounds, to, to their credit, it sounds like 73, or I think I heard 73 or 74 local agencies are reporting their data. Yeah. Uh, um, and I don't know how, I, I've forgotten how many additional ones there are. There's, uh, but, he said there's 71 out of the 73 that are using the same system. Right. And, and the two that aren't using the same system might be collecting the data, but not using the same system. And I think that the the sticks that we put in front of people to start complying with this are pretty severe. They they can't have access to any state grants that come through yeah. for law right. enforcement, and yeah. they can't have access to the academy. That means that they can't send somebody to the academy for training. Right. No, that's, that's pretty, pretty severe. Severe. Yeah. So I see Mark has his hand up. It's interesting on this hybrid system, we can't see that. So I don't know how you'd see it once you're sitting with us here. But anyway. Well, if we're all sitting there, we don't need to see it. No, but Mark may still be remote. Okay. All right. We'll figure that out. I don't want to get there now. We have enough to do. Mark? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just specific to the, the reporting timelines, uh, with respect to um, what's valuable from our perspective, uh, I guess is, uh, if this is a desire for uh, a report to the legislature, uh, committees of jurisdiction, um, or whomever, and this is such as, let's say we write a letter in January, like this is what's going on. I don't see an issue specifically with January 15th. What I would suggest, though, given that the traffic stop race data is currently collected on a calendar basis, uh, the reason why we went with calendar basis is it makes sense that we have consistent periods of time. And so when we start talking about analyzing data, if we create a different time frame for which use of force data would be reported compared to traffic stop data, we're going to have to pick a different date. Uh, than, um, than we do traffic stop data reporting. So for the purpose of apples and apples comparing traffic stop data to use of force data, even though they are separate data sets, there may be some correlations um, or even causations that can be developed based on research or input. The second reason why I would ask for more time than January 15th if we go with the calendar year reporting is because uh, agencies need time to go in and do the, um, what I call, uh, quality assurance, um, specifically uh, when we do traffic, excuse me, my phone fell, um, specifically when we do uh, the traffic stop race data analysis, we go through searching for blank fields. Uh, I just took a look at my agency's fields and we were missing uh, uh, statistics, uh, or I should say information collected on the paper ticket but not collected within our, our record system. And so we had to go through roughly 100 different incidents to find out why uh, why either gender wasn't captured or why uh, we forgot to put the date of birth in or something like that. So that there needs to be some sort of time allowed for agencies to do that. Um, while I personally don't care for the September date, uh, given that we're reporting 2021 data by September of 2022, um, I've been told by some smaller agencies that lack administrative resources that they will literally need those nine months to make sure that all of their data is accurate. Now, my agency, we literally need probably a month to do it. Um, public safety, I believe, does it on the uh, uh, in real time because they have uh, staff to support that initiative. Uh, so I, I guess my recommendation, if you're considering timelines, uh, would be to uh, mirror the traffic stop race data collection because those uh, okay. the, the administrative burden is going to be carried by the same people. Uh, and they might be able to realize some benefits while they do both report uh, reporting work at the same time. Um, and if you want to change the frequency or how quickly you get the information, you might want to consider changing what's in 20 VSA 2366, maybe to a July report date um, that also coincides with the report date for use of force data coming out. Okay, I think and that, that makes sense to me. So, um, if the, we should, Ben, did you get that? 
Um, so just to, to clarify, so do we want the September 1st date? Was that to accommodate the smaller agencies as well? I think Mark suggested we could go with July. And the smaller agencies might become more adept at it as they go on and um, get more used to use, using it. And if it's, even if they were having a hard time reporting, it's probably some of the really smaller ones and we'd get a lot of data anyway by July 1st yeah. is my guess. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So I'm still trying to clarify. So data from 2021 would be available in July of 2022. Yeah. Right. And then we would get a report. In, Janu in July. In July. Yeah. Okay. The data would be and scrutinized that, and, yeah. and it may take them a while to do a report after the data is collected. Yeah. I mean, no, and yeah, I'm not opposed yeah. to a time outside of our session. I think there's a lot yeah. of other people who care and we can yeah. still look at it. I, I'm well, fine with either July or September. Whatever you think is best. I think Jul I think July. July. That gives six months. Okay. Um, and, and one one more thing uh, for the committee, just as far as the substance of it. So, talk, asking for the type of data collected, how it's accessible, how it's being used, a review of the data to determine if additional data points are needed, and recommendations as to what those uh, data points may be, um, and then. Any recommendations related to any resources needed to facilitate uh, the data collection? Well, re recommendations for changes that need may need to be um, made, whether it's resources or legislative changes or policy or changes or whatever. Just recommended recommended recommendations for helping to improve the data collection and use. Okay. Okay. Thank you for indulging me on that. Oh, I'm you. That's helping. <laughs> check the work time. All right. So, well, we whipped right through that one. Uh, <laughs> no, but these are these are important issues, and it's important for us to understand. Yeah. What, what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. So mm -hmm. I think that that whipping through is not the best the best choice. Um, Speaking did we want to go back to section nine because we did begin to take some testimony on that? Falco um, no. talked about it and the. Yeah, but he said not really. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just one person. Is there another section that you'd want to tackle? I'd like to get uh, spend another ten minutes, maybe. Yeah, if we, I have a five o'clock call, but I, I think it would be great if we could deal with section nine and finish that. I, I'm not. That makes me want to know whether deception is different from false. No. So. I, so um, go ahead. I don't know who that was. Chair White, if I may, too, um, you know, in this, some, potentially some examples from the cases may be helpful to elucidate sort of what this law may do compared to at least what's considered in the case law right now. Um, you know, so what this does, I believe, is that it would elevate misrepresentations. Um, regarding evidence that create questions of the suspect's culpability, uh, meaning like false incrimination, and it would put them on the same level of um, false statements that may induce a confession by overcoming the suspect's will. And that and, and that sort of distinction in the case law right now. Um, and I think a good example um, to give that is that Lies that threaten the suspect's ability to retain custody of a child rendered a ch child rendering confession involuntary 
because they could induce a confession by overcoming the suspect's will. That's not nothing. That's not necessarily anything that has to do with the evidence of the case. That's something that's sort of outside and extrinsic to the case. However, the case law also says lies about evidence of the charge, which would have to do with the, the case itself, are more likely to evoke feelings of a suspect suspect's um, beliefs about his or her own culpability. And that last point isn't necessarily something that could be considered involuntary in every case. So what this law would do is elevate, you know, those beliefs about culpability, you know, maybe falsely incriminating oneself to the same level of those beliefs of overcoming someone's will. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions on that distinction a little bit more, but that's what, for instance, if you look in the bill itself, um, in subsection B, subdivision two, you know, it, it says that basically it would be involuntary if it creates a substantial risk that the defendant might falsely incriminate themselves. So that could go to their own culpability. If they think that, oh, well, I'm culpable because of this false statement based on the evidence, that's something then that, that can now be considered as opposed to under the case law it's less clear that it would be. And so what this bill would do is elevate it to say that this is something that could be considered in the involuntary confession analysis. And I'd also say that there's no way that this would do away with litigation on this subject at all. This would absolutely continue to be litigated, but it would provide, um, and perhaps how Commissioner uh, Sherling uh, categorized it as different guardrails um, for the court to consider. Um, within that analysis. I hope that, I hope you stayed with me on that. I know it's a little dense. Can you give a, some examples maybe? I uh, Commissioner Sherling's example was a good one of his, is that what you're talking about? Are more examples like what Michael gave us of, yeah. of, having, of posing as a, as a 13 or 14 year old child? Right. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of, um, that's that is um well I, I i'm thinking about the um the a a misrepresentation that would would um create a substantial risk that the defendant might falsely incriminate himself or herself and elevating this to that same um level of um overcoming the subject's will I, I just, I guess I don't, um, I don't. Yeah, um, I, I can attempt to do that. And I, I think what, what it would be, so for instance, there's another example, and, and there's a case that actually really outlines all this. It's a State v. Colts case. Um, C-O-L-T-S? K-O-L-T-S, yes. Um, and in that case, there were various arguments put forth about whether or not certain confessions were considered involuntary based on the circumstances. There was one that the defendant argued that the police coerced him into confessing by promising that if he did not, or that if he did, then his niece would not have to testify in the case. And threats to arrest a suspect's family member can render a confession involuntary. However, the court found, but there's no legal authority to support the defendant's contention that the confession was involuntary because su police suggested that the niece would have to testify unless he confessed to having assaulted her. And this was not a promise made by the detectives, but a prediction. So it wasn't something that was, you know, misrepresented. It was saying it was something that would happen. So it's, it's a fine line and a fine distinction but it doesn't also have to do with the, the evidence that's already gathered. It's about what the evidence that would be put forth in the future. And so they said that that wasn't necessarily enough to overcome his will because it wasn't, it didn't have to do with, with the case itself. And I know that we're kind of getting into really, really fine details and concepts. It, it, it didn't have to do with the case. It had to do with right. The, and and I, think, the case. I think that the main point to, to take away from this is that there are a lot of tactics that police can use that 
go to you know whether or not it can play to the the individual's feelings however what this law would do is to make it clear that if it goes to the evidence of the case and not necessarily someone's feelings it can be elevated to an involuntary confession level so you can <laughs> oh, I, I, I apologize if i'm if i'm no, convoluting the issue no, it makes sense yeah, um, it but but it really you know it's it's a totality of the circumstances analysis and you know and another thing is is that courts of reason that an interviewer's use of false evidence is less likely to produce an involuntary confession than an interviewer's lie about matters that are external to the charge itself and i think what this bill uh, the what the language of the bill would do is to elevate that false evidence or, lot, or representations about false evidence would be elevated to that status about external matters as well. So it makes it, it puts it on the same level to say that these things can be considered involuntary as an involuntary confession. <clears throat> that so, is a challenge for law enforcement. I think that that's what is a challenge for Michael. So, what what's the um, bar for um, communicating false facts about evidence? I, I mean, I'm trying to think here. If we say, well, we found the we found the gun, but they really didn't find the gun. That's clearly uh, say that is false evidence. Um, false information about evidence. But if they say, well, um, I mean, where where is the line about what is false information about evidence? Is there a line or is it a case by case decision or um, it, if- If somebody, I may, Madam Chair, I, yeah. I think I can, I, I can give okay. you where we train and where, uh, so, uh, also, for the record, I was a criminal law instructor at the academy for and have lost track of the number of years. So this is an area of operations that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we, both the case law and our training curriculum, um, the current training curriculum is not to use deception to the greatest extent possible. It, it's actually evolved quite a bit. Vermont was one of the early adopters uh, of a curriculum that we're happy to, to share um, that uses deception in a very limited fashion. Um, but deception is used in, uh, especially in egregious cases in, uh, and facts are presented uh, or, um, potential facts are presented, uh, because it is not off. It is never, um, in a guilty defendant's interest to incriminate themselves. So, the senator's example of a uh, gun being located, we may say something like, would it surprise you to learn that we have found um, the murder weapon? We would not say, and we train in the case law indicates, we would not say to someone, uh, we found the weapon and your fingerprints are on it, if we don't know the answer to that. We may frame a question um, saying, uh, and maybe we've actually found the weapon. We may frame it and say, uh, the weapon's been located um, is there any reason to believe your fingerprints are on it? Or would it surprise you to learn your fingerprints are on it before an analysis is complete uh, on the fingerprints? That is, the, and the courts have ruled that those kinds of questions that pose a, uh, an alternative to someone who is guilty of the crime or who is, um, in this case, fingerprints will be found on that weapon is not enough to induce an innocent person to say, sure, the, you, you probably found my uh, fingerprints on this murder weapon. So it's those kinds of things that um, are, I hesitate to call them deceptive, but they are um, alternative questions that are designed specifically to elicit a response from someone who um, is involved in whatever it is that's being investigated. Other false facts, I'll just give you one other example, and it also goes to uh, child sexual exploitation. Um, 
it would not be uncommon for a sex crimes investigator, and I've done this, so you can read about it in affidavits I authored some years ago, um, to say to a defendant, you know, uh, while we're talking about a six or seven year old, you know, she looks older than she is, and I, I, I get that, you know, she was coming on to you. Um, so that's probably why you let your guard down and let this happen. Am I telling them a true statement? Absolutely not. Is it going to induce an innocent person to provide a confession or admit to doing a, a, a sex act with a child? No, it's not. Um, so those are the those are a, a couple of examples of, um, again, much more rare instances now that we use uh, deception or, or um, false facts as they're described here. I, I wouldn't necessarily describe them exactly that way, but those kinds of interview techniques um, to induce a person who is guilty to provide information that indicates their guilt. And uh, inhibiting those kinds of things would impair public safety in key arenas um, like sexual violence and homicide because they're typically used only in, uh, or most prominently, I should say, I guess I can't say they're never used in other cases, but it's those kinds of cases where these kinds of detailed interviews occur. So is... Do we know um, Falco or Commissioner or anybody, do we know how much of a problem this is in Vermont? I mean, we know that, or we hear that it's a huge problem in many places, but do we know if it's a problem here in Vermont that we need to have, take on? I am not aware of any false confession cases um, that have uh, reared their heads in Vermont, um, but that just means I'm not aware of any that doesn't necessarily uh, exclude them completely, so. Falco, do you know? I can look into that more, but I, I do think that even if this is not something where we can point to a, a case on point right now, that doesn't take away the utility of putting guardrails in place to make sure that these actions don't happen in the future. And I also want to speak to some of the examples that we heard where just the representation of false facts in itself would not disqualify a statement from being entered into evidence. You know, if you look at B1 and 2, those are the factors that need to be considered. It would then need to undermine the reliability of the defendant's statement or create a substantial risk the defendant might falsely incriminate themselves. And I believe the examples we heard earlier were situations where they would not be falsely incriminating themselves. They might be getting false information, but then incriminating themselves for crimes that they actually did commit. So I think that's just one thing I want to elevate into this conversation. It's not prohibiting the use of any false information to gain confessions, but it'd be those that substantially uh, create a substantial risk the defendant might falsely incriminate themselves. But also happy to look and see if I can find any uh, statistics on false confessions here in Vermont. I just don't have those at my fingertips right now. Yeah, I see. Yep. Yes. Thank you. I see Julio has his hand up. You're muted. You're muted, Julio. Thank you, Julio Thompson, Attorney General's Office, Civil Rights Unit. Um, there, ha there haven't been any studies put out by the Innocence Project, and there's a national exoneration registry that is hosted by the University of Michigan, uh, which also doesn't uh, identify any false confession cases for Vermont. I, I, but in terms of whether it's an issue or not, I think um, there, we need to have a fuller picture of the training that's provided in Vermont, because it, while it is true that the academy teaches a model called the peace model, which is uh, really a creature of uh, practice in the UK after a notorious series of cases involving false confessions. Um, it's also true that Vermont um, is the site for training for other training um, that has come under a lot of criticism uh, in, in, by psych psychologists and criminologists and, and many law enforcement uh, executives, which is called the Reed Technique. Um, uh, this May, um, the third week in May, the South Burlington Police Department uh, is hosting a, a Reed Technique uh, seminar that's taught by that company that provides 
uh, that style of interrogation. The read technique, unlike the peace technique, which is taught at the academy, and which is taught, I believe, uh, to most, if not all, Vermont State Police detectives, is a coercive model. Um, it relies heavily on deception. Um, it starts off by assuming that the person being interrogated is, uh, or the interrogation phase to elicit a confession, starts with the with the assumption that the person's guilty, and then there are various psychological ploys that are used to uh, to get that confession, uh, including misrepresenting facts. Um, it's not, to to my knowledge, that's not prohibited for any law enforcement officer uh, to sign up for. Um, I don't think state police prohibits its officers to go to that. Uh, at least I haven't been, been informed of that. So I think that, you know, what's going on in, in Vermont is uh, a little bit unknown to us. There, there aren't really standards. I'm not aware of any policy that, I, and I'd love to see them if they do exist, because that would be good good background and maybe models to use, but I'm not aware of any policy that says deception should be used uh, rarely. Um, in the DNA case, the Colts case, and I missed part of the testimony, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but that was a case where the defendant was told that they had enough DNA, uh, enough DNA evidence to convict him, which is very much like the fingerprints on the gun. And the Vermont Supreme Court said that that did not result in an involuntary confession. Um, so, um, so it remains <clears throat> very much unknown. I, I didn't hear testimony, and again, I'm sorry, because I missed some of it. Um, this has been recognized as an acute problem in the area of juveniles uh, when youth are being inter interrogated or interviewed. Um, that um, back in 2012, the International Association of the Chiefs of Police, which is a law enforcement based organization, put out a report specifically about interviews and interrogation of juveniles that relied heavily on a lot of empirical studies about how susceptible young people are to false memories uh, through coercive techniques and through deception. Um, in part of the report, um, uh, the, the person may, if they're told by an adult or, or even several adults um, that they did it, they may, uh, according to the IACP report, they may be at the point where they question their own recollection. They may think they blacked out and that they really did do it. Or they may be more likely to engage in short-term thinking to confess in order to get out. They might be told, you know, that, yeah, if the quickest way to, to resolve this is just to confess. So it, it's, a, it's a deep subject and, and the legislation that has been passed in the country so far, it's in two states, has focused on juvenile interviews, not, not adult interviews. Uh, Oregon and Illinois last year passed laws that make it presumptively involuntary, although the prosecution can overcome that presumption if they have evidence that it genuinely was a voluntary confession. This is this this area is really uh, there is a lot more to especially juvenile in interviews than this bill can address. For example, Vermont right now is I think lagging behind uh, behind other states and just simply requiring that custodial like felony interviews be recorded. Uh, existing law only requires a recorded interview for a homicide or sexual assault uh, investigation. Um, uh, to me, to my to my ear and my eye, when I look at this, this seems to me like something that would be very ripe for criminal justice counsel examination because I think that, uh, particularly in the area of juveniles, where I think there is quite a bit of research showing that that's more problematic than, than adults. Uh, there are many other dimensions of. Uh, of interviews, especially with underage um, uh, uh, subjects or suspects that, that go beyond deception in, term, in terms of their ability to, when they can talk to their parents, how long the interview is and the like. So I, I think it's, and I think you would want to, I mean, it just, you know, after the 
the legislature authorized the CJC to develop the fair and impartial policing policy where you had a lot of input, a lot of information about real experience, um, the use of force, statewide use of force policy is something that's being trained now. This is really, to, to us, the sort of subject that really de deserves that examination because there, there are lots, there are things that are in this bill that might be a little broad and then there are other things that such as recording, which it seems like a simple thing, um, that, that aren't in there. And so I think, you know, you would want something that is very robust. I, I thought I remembered when we were doing um, some work with the Innocence Project um, and we had, um, I don't know if any of you read that book, Picking Cotton. It was a pretty amazing book about this guy that was, that, uh, the woman identified him as the rapist, and meanwhile, her real rapist was actually sitting in the courtroom chuckling. And um, they got together afterwards and wrote a book, and his name was Cotton. That's why it was called Picking Cotton. And um, it's a pretty amazing story. And they came to Vermont and worked with us on the Judiciary Committee, and I thought we we prohib we did a couple things. I thought we required that they'd be recorded and prohibited um, um, lineups and prohibited those um, show the, when they show the pictures, you know, and they do different faces and put eyes and put them together in different ways. I thought we did a lot of that at that time. And that was maybe, oh, I don't know six years ago, seven years ago? Well, the statute I'm referring to is section 5585 of Title 13, which identifies two classes of criminal offenses that require recordings. Oh, um, okay. And that's, that's homicide and sexual assault. Okay. Um, and yeah. um, so, I mean, uh, my larger point really is that there, there is a lot, it, it's, it's a great issue, um, I think that uh, to be examining, um, but I do, I do think that it's, it's a really deep issue. And in particular, um, it's hard to like characterize the interrogation or the styles or how the techniques are used because it, it varies very much. I think you got a little bit of that from the testimony interviews of a sex offender or a sex offense suspect versus the interview of a domestic violence suspect versus someone who um, uh, what is something who might be in a, you know believed to be an experienced narcotics um, dealer or distributor um, that that you know the approaches are really quite really quite different um, and um, and also, the, the demographic of the uh, the age it, it is true that the Vermont Supreme Court looks at it in a very fine-grained way how old the person is if the person has any impairments and that's not just necessarily cognitive impairments it could be for example that the person has ADHD or some other uh, disorder that limits their ability to stay focused for a period of time or may have some impulse control and and the like in terms of whether that's Voluntary, but um, you know, it is a it is a curious thing to us that the state um, is still at the point where it's where different agencies are holding two very radically different models of interviewing because the piece method and, and the read technique couldn't be further apart uh, in terms of their assumptions about whether and to what extent officers can actually detect deception or whether they are misinterpreting behaviors, fidgeting, uh, eye aversion as signs of anxiety versus something else, which may fool examiners into, you know, assuming too quickly that they have the right person and then using the more pressure-filled techniques. So the fact that there isn't a, a standard that is, that is um, that applies once you leave the academy. Um, I think the link uh, to the read uh, technique 
training, I think, is actually provided uh, currently on the CJC's website. Uh, it, it's, a, it's no endorsement, but I think they list trainings that are available in the state for law enforcement. And that's, I think that's how I found, I found that one. So it, it may be some, this to me sounds like a, a subject that the CJC really needs to get its, its minds around and talk to a, a lot of detectives and defense counsel and, um, you know, get information from, you know, the, the psychiatrists and psychologists who've looked at um, you know, at the issue of voluntariness in, in that context. Is this something that, I mean, the more I hear you talking, the more I think that there's, there's something here, but it's not enough, that it's, it needs more depth. And, and I wonder if, if it would make sense to ask the CJC and the Justice Oversight Committee to work maybe even with um, CSG with the Justice Center around trying to figure out what kinds of, um, what are the kinds of um, interviewing techniques that are good and, and what should, when should we record and when should, when when should we use these um, methods and not other methods? I, I don't know, but I, I just, um, and, and separate it into both juvenile and adult, I, gu I guess, and ask them to come back with some real in-depth um, recommendations that we can um, then create some policies that, and they could be, we could put them in legislation, but they could also be statewide policies that are some of those policies that with, where, with the carrot and the stick, that if, if agencies don't use those techniques or violate them, they wouldn't in the same way as violating other policies, they wouldn't have access to the academy or to grants. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but the more I hear you talking, the more I think this needs to be um, more. Well, I think that, I mean, I think there is a distinction between policy and law and whether you wanna have minimum requirements uh, or, or something that mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is addressed in, in, a, in a policy that everyone is entitled or is, is required or expected to use, I mean, like with, with the language that's used in here looks like it's borrowed uh, in some parts from pending bills that are in New York State. And I haven't heard testimony or seen testimony there about how some of them would apply. Like, I, you know, looking at the bill, at least right now, I, I'm not sure how one would determine what is a substantial risk of a false confession. Because it does, I mean, even if it, I mean, it sounds like that would be true. It would be involuntary, even if later on other evidence show that the confession wasn't false. So I think that, I mean, the other, the approach that's used in the other states is like an, a, a presumption, but it's, but it's rebuttable. So there's some flexibility um, and it is targeted there. It's just targeted for juveniles, but there are all kinds of issues that can come up. I mean, my, the, the, Custodial interview policies that I'm familiar with from other non-Vermont law enforcement agencies, they're 15 single space pages. Uh, I recently shared the ones that were recently enacted in Baltimore. The master policy about all custodial investigations and they have some limits on the types of deception. For example, you can't create a document and then present that as an authentic document. You can't do that. Um, uh, under their policy, but then they have another 10 page policy that's specific to juveniles mm -hmm. to detail um, what counts as effective consent from the juvenile, um, where is it going to be recorded, how long it how long the interview can take place, uh, whether they're permitted to confer with their parents and, and if so when, um, because there are there are places where um, there are, uh, they do have a history of false confessions. I don't, like I said, I don't have information 
to say that that's been borne out here, but that's sort of like waiting for the, the coal mine to collapse in a way when, you know, from our perspective, the fact that the, it, the International Association of Chiefs of Police you know, 12 years ago said you really have to be careful and really, really avoid deception with juveniles for these psychological based, you know, psychology based reasons. That to me is an environment that says we should, we shouldn't have to wait um, to get the cases. We should just act responsibly. And I think the work is already being done out there. So, I saw Senator Rahm Hinsdale, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I know people are running late to things and, and I have a proposal and I really appreciate Julio's testimony, I just started looking at the read method and it feels like exactly what people think, you know, works from law and order that seems really problematic. You know, if, if the investigator feels the person's guilt is clear, then they make an unequivocal statement that the evidence demonstrates the person's guilt as a positive confrontation to the suspect. Then they present the moral justification for the offense and presents that in a sympathetic way to the person. And then the rest of the interrogation follows. I mean, it seems like exactly what, what is a problem in, in a modern context for coercing a confession. Um, so I sort of thought about a rewrite that I could work on. And number one, I actually, I, I was under the impression mistakenly that we were recording all interrogations. I feel like if something- I was too rises to the level of interrogation, it, it should simply be recorded. I mean, people go away for a long time for property crimes and, you know, other crimes that aren't considered as severe. Um, so I, I would suggest we advance some, or I'll rewrite something that says we record all interrogations. Um, we, we ban the training based on techniques that introduce the use of false information to coerce a confession. We ban this for youth, and then we study the rest. We study what the the sort of threshold is for what um, coerces a false confession um, to to return with more information. Could would you could you have that language done by tomorrow? Do you think so? We could look at this, or at least a, just a rough maybe. Right, I have my chicken scratch. I'm looking at Ben <laughs> to see. Um, <laughs> What time tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> well, after it'll be it'll be kind of late after, because it'll be after, after an afternoon committee, and we have the floor, which okay. will be lengthy. Uh, yeah, I, I think I could make that work. Um, so just to go over, so it was um, Senator Ann Hinsel, Could you just go over once more about what you'd like to what you just outlined? Yes. So recording all uh, all investigation interrogations. That may lead to all felony. a criminal all felony. confession. Yeah, sorry, a felony confession. Um, a, a, a ban on the training of uh, the, of training that relies on false information to coerce a confession. I don't know if we need to call out the read technique. I hope people would know what we're talking is, about. Is it R E A D? R E I D. R E I D. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. I had the same question. Um, a ban, a ban on the use of false information related to coercing a confession for youth, which sounds from what we're doing like it generally shouldn't be a problem. Other states have done this, um, and then studying the rest of what we've talked about for adults. And the study would probably be done by criminal, uh, the justice council and the. Um, um, Justice Oversight Committee, does that make sense? Using the expertise of the AG's office and law enforcement and um, ACLU and stuff. Is that who should be doing the study? Is the Justice Oversight Committee with the uh, Criminal Justice Council? I'm not, this is Julio Thompson. I'm not sure to whom you were directing the question. Well, I just, I was yeah. kind of asking Senator Rom Hinsdale if yeah. she thought that's who made sense to to be doing it. But we can. Uh, why don't um, I'll talk to Sears in the morning to see if that because he does the Criminal Justice Council. I mean, he does the Justice Oversight Committee, and then 
the Criminal Justice Council would be um, because they're they do the training and stuff. Yeah. And look who showed up. Yeah. Is that does that make sense, Chris? Christopher? Uh, absolutely, the, Madam Chair. The, okay. the, the council would be happy to weigh in on that with, with other partners as well. Yeah. And and council of state governments, the justice center might might be helpful here too because they could look at this as part of re, uh, justice reinvestment too, I think. And, 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 and maybe the, I, Julio, I think spoke about the Innocence Project. I don't know if that, they also might. Well, they, yeah, they could, uh, but I, I'm thinking of officially naming who, right. who, who, because if, if we can get the uh, Council of State Governments involved in it, they have resources. And when would the uh, study or report? Um, well, how long would the you know committee take it up, and when, when would it need to issue a report? Well, they meet over the summer fall. The justice oversight meets over the summer and fall, and I would say they should come with a at least a progress report by um, mid January, so that we can look at it and see. They don't. I wouldn't think they need to, sometimes say, putting a date on a report is more harmful than just saying we need to have a progress report by this point. Um, you may be done, you may have come to your conclusions, but at least we need some kind of a progress report. Okay, um, so a progress report by, I believe you said January 1st? Yeah. And, um, and then who would, draft the report would that be the criminal justice council would that be csg well i would leave it up to the justice oversight committee because they have um staff they have the um it might be you <laughs> i don't know who will staff them this summer and fall it might be you but it um they can figure out who will draft the the report Okay, so at their discretion through the. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. Yeah, I think that was a good suggestion, Senator Ram Hinsdale. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Julio. I, this has been really helpful and yeah. illuminating. Thank you. There are, there are many people who are very, very knowledgeable about the non-coercive method of interviewing the Vermont State Police. I, I think the commissioners left, but I, I just add that I think in 2018, they were, I think the first in the state to pilot that program. There's there's actually been a, a, a little bit, a bit of academic writing about the Vermont uh, pilot program. And that is the curriculum they teach at the academy. Um, yeah. So there are, there are the, you know, like the current instructor uh, was very helpful to me uh, earlier in the week of uh, getting up to speed in terms of where VSP is. So I think we're, we're lucky in Vermont that we have some subject matter experts about that more, more modern rapport-based, um, um, less pressure-based uh, 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 paradigm of, of questioning, which is, which is considered kind of the, the leading. There are other non-coercive models out there, but the peace model is kind of the, you know, is, is the, the front edge of it. So, so we're lucky in that respect. Well, thank you everybody. And thanks for um, hanging in there. Um, so tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, we will have some time. We will look at um, the, the section one is the attorney general's ability to, um, investigate um uh and i don't know if we need that if they can do it without that or not but we will look at that and the yeah. um and um julio is shaking his head so we they cannot. can't do it without this so right. okay so we'll look at that and which of the remaining ones <clears throat> are the most the ones that we should look at the most and we should look at whether there's the 
independent investigations, the law enforcement officer uh, database, and and then the disclaimer, which is the Giglio. Is that how it's pronounced? Giglio. Oh. I wasn't pronouncing it right either. <laughs> so we have those. Which should we um, address first of those four remaining? Um, I'm I'm going to vote for Julio because I think there's been some discussion and agreement around okay. that one. Um, That's it, section eight. Yep. Yeah. Right yeah. Okay. We'll take that one first. Okay. Okay. It would be. Uh, great to get a state's attorney. I mean, this is a big issue, as you heard on VPR and in Digger, uh, for the state's attorney. So I, I'd encourage us to have the state's attorney's way in on this. Evan, Evan well, should weigh in on this too. Evan, probably we probably will have Evan. Um, okay. I'm sure that John Campbell has been notified, and but Evan is a is really good. He's been spending a lot of time in a judiciary. Oh, he's a great addition. So, okay, so we'll start with that and then uh, go next to the um, AG's ability to investigate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, all right. So we'll do it in that order and see where, how far we get. And then we'll, we'll go as far as we can. Yeah, I did not over the break talk to Bill Sorrell about <laughs> feels like it doesn't qualify as independent or kind of the the showing independence. So I will talk about that section with him before. We okay. Okay. But we'll start with the exactly. section eight and then section one and then see how, how far we get. This has been really good discussion. Thank yeah, you. This was actually, this was a very productive day. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, we look forward to seeing you in person tomorrow. I will be so I will be so happy. Although we have about five inches of snow right now. We don't have any. No. So you're driving to dry. I well I'm and I'm driving in the morning. I'm not coming up tonight. And you no. might not be happy to see me, but just just a note that I will also be there in person. Oh, no, Thursday. we will be happy to see you. <laughs> yeah, we're happy. A full I'm happy to see you. I, and, and I have your wedding present, which is, I have to say, really a nice thing to be able to finally give you. I'm excited. <laughs> no, it's always nice to be there in person and exchange. Yeah, <laughs> it will be great. It will be great. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Uh